The Savior, a guy with bright yellow eyes and black hair, breathes heavily and gazes forward at his opponent, a man entrusted with the mission of saving humanity. The hero muttered that everything had gone wrong again. He stands opposite the steps leading to the throne of the demon, which is blazing with fire. The castle is cold and dark. Only candles and rare torches illuminate the space. The protagonist's right hand holds a sword, and his left, mechanical hand is tightly clenched into a fist. Blue patterns are visible on the hero's body. The demon, with a muzzle resembling a fly and an arthropod body covered in fur in some places, was impressed that the hero was able to receive the power of the blessings of the gods of this world. The monster was surprised that the pitiful human body could withstand something like this. He called the hero the savior of humanity and allowed him to be proud of himself. The guy looked at the demon in front of him with contempt and anger. The demon continued to say that his opponent had achieved what 71 demons could not achieve. The Lord of Hell stood up from the throne, went down several steps, and said with pity that this would all end, and even if he were to be defeated, his army would lose. The main character interrupted the demon. He said he knew about his plan. The demon was surprised. The guy began to exude mana. He named two archdemons with 30 and 31 demonic legions, Agar and Barbados, whom Bebub sent to the mortal world because there are no players there now who could resist them. He asked if Bebub thinks that if he attacks humanity while the main character is not in the human world and closes the dungeons that connect the two worlds, he will be able to win. The demon didn't have time to react. The hero cut off the demon's head with a lightning strike. A system window appeared in front of him with the inscription that the hero defeated the demon Bilabob, the strongest of the 72 demons of Solomon. There are two demons left. The guy frowned, exhaled, and said how bad he felt. In the first three regressions, he tried his best and thought this time it would work. After five regressions, he could still cry sometimes. The hero wanted to give up and abandon his duty as a savior, but each time he convinced himself that the next attempt could be successful. He pointed the sword at himself and pierced his chest with it. This happened 14 times, and the main character was tired of everything. Demons, 72 disasters described by Solomon in the Book of Lethan, became the masters of the dungeons that appeared two years ago. A year has passed since the weapons of the human world became useless against demons. Korean players faced three dungeons on their small piece of land at once. They fought every day to free these lands from all monsters. The main character was breathing heavily and woke up screaming, his face depicting surprise. Swaying a little, he leaned against the wall and covered his face with his palm. He muttered that he had a headache, exhaling heavily. The guy said thoughtfully and returned again to Vault Andromalius, one of the three dungeons in South Korea, a huge cave that appeared in Gangwon province. It was here that the hero, the porter of another player, began his path of regression. The main character hit the wall with a trembling fist and said, with a face full of regrets, what other savior? He cannot even save himself. He added, someone shouted, gargoyle, where did the monster from the abyss come from? The first event from which the hero's regression begins, the resident curses and says with fear that he needs to run. A stone gargoyle with red glowing eyes sits on the roof of the house, spreading its wings. The young player turns to the main character and calling him a porter, shouts for him to fire the signal faster. The gargoyle growls, people, invasion, kill the monster, screeched fearfully. The player tries to attract the attention of the main character by shouting, why is the idiot frozen, signal? The main character grimaced with the thought that he could not get used to this vile face. The player's name is Kim Sunbin. He angrily runs away from a gargoyle that has jumped from a building and is ready to attack. Kim Sunbin only recently became a player but already showed great promise even signed a contract with the god of Scandinavian mythology, Hymal, and he's also a freak. Kim's son, Ben, continued to run towards the main character, shouting to give the signal. The main character exhaled, frowning slightly. Kim's son, Ben, cursed and said that he couldn't believe he hired such an idiot. With these words, he rummaged through a huge backpack while the main character stood nearby, indifferently. Kim's son, Ben, pulled out a flare gun and fired into the air. A red flash flew into the sky. The player muttered, Great, now you just need to wait, then grabbed the main character by the shoulder and shouted that he was an idiot. They didn't give the signal so late because of him. Therefore, he will be bait. But before Kim's son, Ben, had time to finish speaking, the main character punched him in the face. 
and then calmly said that Kim Bin himself had come across a gargoyle, let him figure it out himself and not try to use a common man as bait to save his life. Kim Sun Den shook a little after the blow and muttered that the hero was a useless idiot. Meanwhile, the main character was thinking that he had already died because of him but still wasted time and was bait for the gargoyle, black horn with gold trim, gel horn, a divine item belonging to Heimdall. The constellation of this idiot, which will definitely come in handy in the war with legions of demons in the future. Kim's son, Ben's eye and cheek were swollen after being hit. He shouted that he wouldn't leave it so easily and began to pull the sword out of its sheath. The main character continued to think that no matter how ugly Kim Bin was, he should not die, and that even without this, the hero was considered a savior who cannot simply look at a person in danger. Suddenly, the gargoyle was over Kim's son Bin, ready to tear him into pieces. He only managed to look at her with his uninjured eye. The monster pinned the player to the ground with lightning speed with its huge paw, and the main character managed to jump back. He looked at the guard gargoyle with determination and extended his hand to the rebounding sword. The gargoyle growled, The man is alive. Kill. The main character grabbed the sword and said, Then you need to quickly destroy the monster before anyone comes to the help signal. If they notice the porter killing a gargoyle, then he will receive attention that he does not need, muttered the main character, exhaling heavily while the monster roared loudly. To defeat the gargoyle, given its huge three-meter body, he will have to strike at a specific point. Therefore, experienced players do not like to hunt her alone, the hero thought. But the monster interrupted the hero's flow of thoughts with shouts of, Die, intruder! The monster swung and hit the place where the hero was standing, but he managed to jump away. On the other hand, it can be killed at a weak point, even without being a player, the hero thought with determination. He climbed onto the gargoyle by the paw of which she hit the ground, jumping deathly. He found himself above the monster, a small hole just a centimeter right on the neck. The hero saw this small hole not protected by the monster's armor. Here, he thought, and threw the sword straight into this hole. The hero landed behind the monster, until cracks appeared from the place where the sword landed along the gargoyle's body. Man, the gargoyle said, syllable by syllable. She tried to pronounce intruder, but broke into hundreds of stones. A system window again appeared in front of the player, stating that he had defeated the gargoyle without a contract with the constellation. The main character coughed, covering his face with his palm, with the thought that he was returning to the past when he died. The new system window stated that the constellation had shown interest in the player's exceptional achievement, a man who is obliged to save humanity from the invasion of hellish creatures. But he, the main character, is tired of this terrible mission. The system's new notice states that 38 constellations are offering contracts. Surprised, the hero said that most players received up to three requests, and even he had received up to 20 in past regressions. Afterwards, he noticed that this was a good start. The hero thought that if the regressions were repeated until he achieved success, it would be nice to get some rest. The system produced a list of constellations that sent requests to create a contract. Master of the Argonauts, Yossi and Swordmasters, Guardian of the Pantheon, Great Sage, and many other constellation names appeared before the hero in a golden glow. The hero decided that the 15th regression would be whatever he wants, and from today, the savior is retiring. The hero noticed, with curiosity, one of the windows of the system. Black Lord of Muspelheim, a huge flaming demon in stone armor, with a sharp horn in the middle of his forehead, the leader of the giants with whom Ragnarok began in Scandinavian mythology and the main cause of the destruction of the world. The main character said that he had already received contracts from god-level constellations, but he did not think that a being comparable to the creator god would appear. The guy looked at the system window in amazement. Afterwards, he sighed with inspiration and said that in this regression he was still resting. As soon as he reached for the yes button on the system window with an offer to accept a contract from the Black Constellation, the new system window said that the hero had signed a contract with the Black Constellation. The right to resume system operation due to an unexpected error has been obtained. Loading. The main character was surprised and thought out loud with a slight smile that it seems the contracts will not be limited to one constellation. The system displayed a message that the recovery was complete. The contractor receives a new right, thanks to the multiple contract effect. The hero can choose one of the following options. 
First, Lord Musim, second, Godslayer, third, the end of the world. The hero made his choice, and the system window showed that the Lord of Muspelheim had been received. Streams of light and mana swirled around the young man. New system window, name, Lee Young Hack, constellation, black, characteristics, strength, E minus, agility E minus, endurance F, mana F, multiple contract abilities, Lord of Muspelheim. Multiple contract grants the ability to make contracts with multiple constellations, but only use the power of one at a time. Lord Muspelheim, Lord of the Kingdom of Fire on the southern edge of the world, allows you to control fire. Lehak muttered that he didn't expect anything else from such. Two characteristics rose to E. Usually, this takes a whole month. Muttering, the hero picked up the gargoyle fragment. Lehak used the power of fire, and the fragment immediately melted. With genuine surprise, he said that with such mana, one could burn a gargoyle. Someone shouted loudly that they heard the source of the sounds and ordered them to hurry up. The signal was sent a long time ago, but there is hope that the players are still alive. The hero had a thought. They came running. How would I... Before Lehak had time to finish his thought, a girl player in medium armor with a sword and short red hair was approaching worriedly. I want to make sure the players are okay. The knight next to her stared at the body of the gargoyle in bewilderment. He said that they must be in the great depth of the dungeon. The girl asked if the gargoyle was dead. Lay Hawk, sitting on his knees, pressing his palms to his ears, screamed convulsively. The girl, still concerned, approached him and asked if he was okay. The guy turned to her with tears in his eyes and a pitiful face. He said in a trembling voice that he was fine, but Songbin tried to protect him, and the guy barely spoke through fake tears. The girl took Lei Haik's hand and put her arm around his shoulder, apologizing for not coming earlier. She was sincerely sorry for him. She said that she would take him away from here. It's dangerous here. Lei Haik was already thinking to himself, they won't suspect anything, right? The girl took Lei Haik to a stone portal with a pink glow and assured him that it was already safe here. The heroes thanked her, worried that he had caused her so much trouble. The girl good-naturedly told him not to worry about it and said that after investigating such oddities of the dungeon, she would still have to return to the association, and that her job was to protect people from monsters. With that, she placed her left hand on her chest and looked at Lei Hayak with a radiant smile. As she took a step through the pink portal, she asked him to be careful on the way home. Afterwards, the swordswoman disappeared into the portal. Lei Hayak thought out loud that this was his first time seeing her, but she looked like a good person. If everyone were like this, the end of the world could be avoided. The guy started to leave but turned around when the girl screamed. She called out to him and ran up, handing him a black business card with a white phoenix and the inscription Li Jing. Lei Hak thanked her. He thought, Li Jun from the Phoenix Guild? Then, she will die soon. An image of Lei Yun in flames appeared in his memories. She was covered in blood, her face was frozen in fear, and the sword fell from her hand. The cause will be guild incidents caused by one item. Lehawk muttered thoughtfully that it seemed that this object was somehow connected with CER. Maybe we should try to save her since this coincided. The guy, scratching the back of his head, came out of the portal area, fenced with a fence with barbed wire. Lehawk rides a bus through the city and thinks out loud what to do next. He wanted to take a break from regression, but he couldn't just give it all up. In one of the lives, through three dungeons remained open for quite a long time, and after six months, a fourth appeared right in the heart of Seoul. It was a huge rift at the intersection of Highway Cemetery Gijan. Monsters immediately crawled out of it. How else would they kill people? The cause of the disaster was the vile players who postponed the raid on the dungeon, all because of profit. Lehak exhaled lazily and muttered, He'll have to clear the dungeon in time to delay the end of the world as long as possible. It's not like relaxing if he has to do something like this, but there's no one else. And he got an idea as soon as he looked at the business card given to him by Lee Jun. In the fantasy, Lee Young Hak was Lee Jia Young's trainer, sending her into battle like Pikachu. He joyfully exclaimed that he would make her his student. The guy took her number from her business card and sent several messages. Hello, this is the porter you saved. The moment was not right then, but I must say that I felt something strange in the dungeon. I think you should know about this. When leaving the bus, Lei Hak said indifferently that she was already a player anyway. 
The guy got off at the stop next to the International Players Association and said thoughtfully, The teacher cannot remain a simple porter. Le Hock entered the association building and heard someone's surprised voice. How many recruiters had gathered? According to rumors, newcomers usually attract the attention of a maximum of three guilds. A bunch of journalists and reporters, camera flashes everywhere. Who will they evaluate, both Comet and Phoenix? The leaders came in person. A dark-haired man in a white suit with a black shirt sat with his arms crossed over his chest, waiting. Next to them sat his agent, wearing dark glasses. Is this Kang Mansik, even guild leader Hung came? The voice ordered someone to stand behind him. Next, attention was paid to a serious young man in round glasses with short red hair and a classic suit. This is the vice head of the Phoenix Guild, Kim Yong-sik. Have these important people really come here and are waiting for the players to be evaluated? Meanwhile, Lei Hock went to the front desk and said that he would like to take an assessment. The girl behind the counter kindly asked him to write his name. The paparazzi continued their cheers. Incredibly, a newcomer with a divine constellation has appeared, Hort Lehak said with a little curiosity. How noisy is his assessment today or what? Becoming a player is quite simple. You need to request a rating from the association and show your strength by defeating the dungeon monster. That's all. Sometimes people who have signed a contract with a strong constellation attract a bunch of recruiters with their assessment. Li Yang Hak entered the player's waiting room where some were sleeping, some were praying, and some were trembling with fear. The sleeping player was awakened by the appearance of Lei Hayak, who sat down not far from him. Studying the reason for today's turmoil, is this guy who made a contract with the creator god, sun god Ra, wiping the saliva from his cheek? He asked Li Haik if he had dozed off. This blonde guy with golden eyes is called Ao Yun, who has the constellation of the sun god Ra, Someone called him by name, so he responded and asked about the reason for his concern. A tall guy with red hair, green eyes, and a beard introduced himself as Kim Young-sik, vice president of the Phoenix Guild, Suzaku Constellation, legendary level. The guy with glasses interrupted Kim Young-sik, saying that normally recruits are not allowed into the waiting room, but he might be given special permission. The recruiter immediately shut him up and turned her attention back to Ku Yun. He asked Su whether he had entered into a contract with the son Gabra and expressed the desire to invite the guy to the guild. So who a little worried and surprised asked how he knew about this, but there was no answer. Leek continued to remember. It all started when Kim Young-seek took Ko Yunu in. The recruiter put his arm around the blonde guy's shoulder and led him away. Lei Hak continued to think that a terrible incident would happen because of their immense greed. He muttered that it was in this incident that his student died and resolutely added that this time, everything would change. An association official handed Lei Haku a player's brochure and politely chirped, congratulations on passing the test, and notified him that registration was complete. The guy noticed to himself that it was difficult to pretend that he was weak. A little surprised, he began to look at the piece of paper. Lei Hug asked if there was a new player brochure. Let's see, Phoenix Guild is recruiting newcomers, Lei Yun, will be the curator. The hero noticed that Lei Yun was ideal for this role and then began to study the conditions for submitting an application. They sound like this. Players who are not members of a guild but have registered must meet the following requirements. The player must have a contract with a constellation of legendary level or above, a contract with fire-related abilities, level E- or above, all characteristics. About a month after his association evaluation, Lei Hock, feeling somewhat baffled, noted that it seemed they weren't looking for any new members. As he walked away, he pondered that the first requirement was simpler than the rest, yet it would draw too much attention. Instead, he focused on narrating the second requirement, which, while not problematic, could also attract unwanted notice due to the rarity of such abilities. Lei then found himself before the massive entrance to the Andalus Labyrinth. Deciding to concentrate on the third requirement, he stepped through the portal with a confident grin. The next opportunity to register was in four days, a timeline nearly impossible for most. Inside the labyrinth, Lei touched a wall, casting a spell that illuminated the area with a glow of red mana and light, forming pentagrams under his palm. With a beaming smile, he declared, Not for me. The wall vanished immediately, revealing a horde of goblins ready to attack. The system updated his location to a secret area in the Endermalus Labyrinth. Specifically, a goblin settlement. 
Lei tackled them barehanded, using only his spells. After a day of constant combat, the system updated his status. His stamina and mana had both increased to E. An orange magic stone, along with a green one, fell into his bag, which already contained many similar stones. Only one for six monsters? Lei grumbled, disappointed by the low drop rate. He decided it was time to leave, having spent a full day there. As he left, turning from the charred remains of the monsters, Lei headed home, exhausted. He voiced his concern about possibly overexerting himself, post-regression, noticing his muscles felt tighter. Mid-sentence, he caught June's gaze. Both were slightly startled by the unexpected encounter. When June began to call him by name, Lei quickly dismissed her confusion, insisting she had mistaken him for someone else and hurried away. She wanted to stop him, reaching out her hand and calling for him to wait, but he had already vanished around the corner of the building. The vice president called out to the girl by name, urging her to hold on and shouting the main character's name in pursuit. However, Kim Young-si intervened, questioning her actions. He reminded her of his position as her boss and instructed her not to forget it. Jun humbly apologized for her eagerness. Meanwhile, Lei Hak leapt back into the portal. As soon as he crossed the threshold, he bent over, hands on knees, trying to catch his breath. The realization of his fatigue hit him, and he pondered whether this regression could truly be considered a rest. A few days later, June stood before the audience seeking permission to demonstrate. She leaned on her sword, facing the new players with a massive gargoyle looming behind her. This is the Phoenix Guild's rookie training program, Jun announced, continuing with the instructions to launch the simulator and activate the monster. A newcomer gasped. Is this thing going to move? Jun turned just as the gargoyle raised its paw, poised to strike. The crowd tried to alert her, but the new recruits watched the ensuing battle awestruck. Among the newcomers, Le Hak assessed Jun's combat skills and was impressed by her prowess, even better than he had anticipated. Meanwhile, Jun skillfully deflected the gargoyle's attack, poised for a counter-strike. Le Hak mused that although her original constellation was human, she could fully unleash the potential of the Goro Swordmaster constellation and elevate it to the highest heroic level. In a swift motion, Jun found herself above the gargoyle, her sword swinging down to sever its head. Her body was enveloped in mana, her focus and determination palpable. Phoenix Guild's Group 3 Supervisor, Li Jun, Constellation Chak Jun Kayang, at a heroic level. A short while later, Li Haun stood pensively, arms crossed over her chest, Despot much thought, she still found it odied that Lei Hak was merely a simple porter. How was a player who registered just four days ago able to raise his stats to level E-? Jun held the test list for new players in her hands. There were three names in the characteristics table. Li Jang-gu, Li Young Hak, and Kim Wee Min. She peered thoughtfully at the stats of the second player listed. A recent conversation with Li Hak surfaced in her memories. He had said that he went goblin hunting because he owed rent. I lured them in one by one. I learned this while I was a porter, he had explained. The girl decided that this could still be explained, but she remembered the situation when she met him on the street. Then she was sure it was definitely young hack and decided to look around the corner of the building. She was very surprised to see traces of burned monsters there. Continuing her thoughts, the girl suggested that maybe he had an innate talent. During another training session, Lei Hak stood at the stand for the training battle and Jia Yun was at the control panel for tuning the monster. She asked the guy which monster he wanted to choose. Young Hak immediately replied that he would like to choose three goblins. The girl grinned in confusion and asked again, three, not thirty? Young Hak responded with a question, thirty goblins? Is this a joke? The girl got a little nervous, felt guilty and apologized, saying that she would do everything now. Three goblins appeared at the stand and attacked the young man. One grabbed his leg, he repelled another with his sword, and the third was ready to attack. Lei ha quietly gave in. June exhaled in disappointment and thought that she had expected something in vain. As it was getting dark, Jia Yun praised all the players and released them from training, while she continued to hone her lunges. The main character was surprised that she was still training. Apparently, she became a curator for a reason. However, it is frustrating. Lei Hayak looked at the girl with misunderstanding and regret. If she uses power like that, God. Her leg twisted. The girl fell, turning over herself and screaming in pain. Inwardly, 
Lei Hock wondered if June was okay. The guy, slightly irritated by the incorrectness of her movements, cried out that he should do it wrong. Jun looked at him indignantly and asked what he said. Lei Hock fell silent, starting to get a little nervous and looked away. He then told the girl a little hesitantly that she needed to concentrate a little more on her back and not on her legs. Jan listened to him angrily, yet with curiosity. The guy continued, explaining that her steps were too wide and that half a step would suffice. Annoyed, John retorted, Who do you think you are to give advice? She continued, accusing him of speaking as if he had already become a ranker, despite his inability to even kill three goblins. She shouted these last words after him, just as Yong Hak was already sprinting away from the training field, shouting back that he had something to do and it was time for him to leave. Furiously, John yelled after him, asking where he was running off to. Later in the evening, sitting in her room, John grumbled irritably, It's easier said than done. He's just a newbie. Her words echoed in her head. Half a step was enough, and she needed to pay more attention to her back. John reasoned that it couldn't get any worse if she tried. Suddenly, a system window appeared in front of the girl. It read as follows. Devastating move, four out of seven. A method of moving with legs aimed at disrupting enemy formations and quickly eliminating enemies. There is a rumor that at the peak of this power, you can cut off the of any opponent in seven steps. You have mastered the four steps. Resolutely, the girl went to the park and began training. She tried to perfect these seven steps. A new system window appeared in front of her, which read, Understanding of the destructive step has been improved. June has mastered the five steps. The curator was surprised that the newcomer's advice worked, but she did not understand how. She looked in bewilderment at her hands holding the sword, standing in the middle of a dark park, illuminated only by the dim light of lanterns. Unbeknownst to herself, she muttered the name Lee Yong Hak. A silent question was reflected on her face. Is he like that too? Meanwhile, Lei Hak and the bear realized that he had not gone somewhere for a long time. He noticed that it was possible to get something there that would be useful to Lejun. The system window notified him that he had entered the secret zone of the Endus Labyrinth, a goblin settlement. The goblins looked at the guy from behind trees, hills, broken branches, and bushes with genuine surprise. There were countless of them. Lei Hak, noticing this a bit lazily, remarked with irritation that he couldn't believe everything had to be cleaned up again. He looked at the goblins with contempt, tongues of flame flashed in his bright red palm, and everything around was instantly filled with fire. There was no one in front of the hero, but he sensed a presence. Lei Hock muttered that he hadn't seen Tong Wang in a long time. The system window notified him that the constellation Fisher of Time had detected something unusual. The constellation of Fish of Time turned their attention to the player, and the test began. The guy created a fishing rod with a spell and smiled broadly. The system elaborated on the essence of the test, to prove that the player was worthy of the attention of this constellation. Lei Hock, with a smile, watched the angry goblins rushing towards him, and enthusiastically agreed to the system's task. In front of him, a golden bridge stretched out, leading to a huge wooden gate at its end. Lea Hawk shouted at the goblins to chase him, calling them bait. He ran as fast as he could across the bridge, with the goblins in hot pursuit. The hero cast a fire spell, and all the goblins running across the bridge were immediately turned into charred meat. Lea Hawk's face expressed genuine enthusiastic interest. He decided that this should be enough and, throwing a fishing rod shrouded in mana into the abyss, at the bottom of which flowed a stormy river, he playfully called someone out. A new system window stated that the tyrant of the lake had awakened from a long sleep. A huge, golden fish with glowing eyes was hooked. The water surged over the abyss. Satisfied with the catch, the hero took the fishing rod in his left hand and, with his right, began to create a fire spell. He exclaimed, Now, it will be fried fish. The huge fish was engulfed in flames. A system window appeared indicating that the player had successfully captured the tyrant of the lake. The sea creature splashed back into the water with a crash. A column of water doused him. New system windows stated that his characteristics had increased significantly. The player's strength had increased to level E, and his agility had been elevated to level E as well. A charred fish lay at the bottom of the abyss, its head and most of its body protruding from the water. 
Another system window appeared stating that skillful use of magic had increased the player's characteristics. The player's mana had increased to level E. Le Hayek was happily surprised. He exclaimed with enthusiasm that the characteristics were growing faster than he expected and that this test was still just as difficult. The wooden gate swung open and a sign hovered in the air in front of the guy. He entered into a contract with the constellation Fisher of Time. The player received a new contract right, and he could only choose one option. The first, unification of the world. The second, tongfish hook three feet from the water. The third, spilled water, will not return to the vessel. Smiling, the guy said this was what he needed. He received a tonfish hook three FT from the water. Toon was fishing, but his hook didn't even touch the water. If the results are known in advance, all that remains is to wait. It will be easier for the player to improve any martial art depending on the level of understanding. As the rays of the setting sun illuminated him, he looked around and decided he needed to go back. A duel began at the Hunters Association between the leaders of the second and third groups. The curator of the second group is a blonde guy in armor. People from the crowd are mostly betting on his victory. They say he will soon become a ranker. Onlookers feel sorry for the curator of the third group. Jun went on the offensive with lightning speed. The enemy could not track her movement. It seemed to him that she had disappeared. The girl lunged and the curator of the second group fell on his back. She herself was surprised that she succeeded. Cheers could be heard from the crowd, astonished that she had defeated the leader of the second group. Muttering to herself in surprise, Jun questioned, Was it really true? The crowd did not subside. Everyone was wondering how she did it. She ended up next to the enemy in an instant. A system window appeared in front of Jun, stating that the player's destructive step had reached the perfect level, a method of moving with legs aimed at disrupting enemy formations and quickly eliminating enemies. They say that at the peak of this power, you can cut off the head of any opponent in seven steps. The girl rushed away from the training room, and people shouted questioningly after her. Where is she going? The sign declared that it was indeed true. The martial art of Chok Jun Kang, lost long ago and inherited by no one, had been brought to perfection by this guy in just a couple of phrases. Jun quickly rushed down the corridor with a look of great surprise and asked herself, how insightful is he? Jun texted Yang Hak, asking if there was time to see each other. At the same time, she thought that she had not advanced in the development of the skill for two months, and that missing this person could leave her stuck for years. The Liyun constellation swordmaster Goryeo's characteristics were strength, C, agility, C+, endurance, C+, and monode. His abilities included one an army swordmaster, sword skill Goryeo, destructive step, one step, one kill, zero out of five, death attack, not studied, and war god spirit, not studied. The girl thought that in order to master all her abilities, she needed a mentor. She was determined and unshakable. A notification came to her phone. Jia Yun immediately picked it up and read the message. Yong Hak answered no when asked if there was time to see each other. Meanwhile, Lei Hak realized that his interlocutor was ready to explode after reading his message. He looked at the phone with a slightly guilty look. New notifications arrived on the device, but the heroes got distracted. The employee at the Magic Stone Exchange Place placed several stacks of bills in front of Lei Hock. A bald man in dark glasses clarified that it amounted to $33,270,000 and also noted that the hero knew how to impress, as a client, of course, judging by the size of the stones they had obtained from goblins who had emptied all their reserves. The employee asked Lei Hock, who responded indifferently, something like that. The employee immediately brushed it off and reassured the hero with the words, I'm not trying to find out where you got so many items. I was just wondering if you decided to cash out so abruptly because of the auction. Interested, Lei Hock replied that it was indeed because of the auction, but questioned why the employee needed to know about it. The man in dark glasses hesitated as he rubbed his hands together. That's what I thought, he said. Nothing serious. I just wanted to warn you. They say that, to participate in the auction, the player must have a representative. He handed the guy a business card which read, Shin Minsu, Auction Consultant, and listed the postal number and address below. The exchanger employee inquired whether the player had an acquaintance who could serve as his representative. 
Lahak, looking at the business card in surprise, thought that he was unaware of this requirement as he had never participated in an auction without an invitation before. I can probably come in, but to purchase you need to meet certain conditions, he remarked, placing the business card into his pants pocket. I'm not looking for anything specific, but I wanted to check something, so I'll give it a try after some time. Lahak, stirring her coffee, watched intently at the source of the sounds of intense training. He considered that she seemed to be following him. Young Hawk observed the red-haired girl, who was diligently waving her sword. It's good, of course, that she listened to the advice, but it's starting to get a bit annoying, he mused, feeling slightly depressed by her presence. He took a sip from his glass. A small crowd had formed next to the girl, discussing and admiring her. Lahak was surprised at how her popularity had sharply increased while he had been searching for the secret Tai Gong technique. Deciding to distance himself further, he approached the monster control panel with the ball in his hands, thinking that he had not yet been officially accepted and that it was better not to attract unnecessary attention. June noticed his presence in the hall and moved a little closer to him. Meanwhile, the guy had decided to start with three goblins, but before he could finish his thought, a loud scream accompanying the swing of Jai Yun's sword interrupted him. He turned to her and asked, Why do you keep following me? The girl turned her head away with a smile and frantically asked, Pursue? What is he talking about? The main character grinned and thought, Will she really pretend that she doesn't understand? He resolutely stated that starting tomorrow, he would stop coming here. The girl was taken aback and looked at him with pleading ease, loudly asking, What? Why? She pointed out that he was doing so well and tried to convince him to stay. However, he interrupted Jun by expressing that he felt uncomfortable and didn't want anything to interfere with his concentration. Suddenly recalling something, she began talking about training, questioning if he had been pretending all along. Before she could finish her sentence, the guy was already at the door, about to leave. The girl squealed and shouted that she wouldn't do it again, pleading with him not to leave. He returned already anticipating this reaction. Jun sank silently, just looking at him. As evening fell, the training room was nearly empty. Jun leaned on her sword, sighing heavily from the pain in her hand. She wondered whether it was the wrong moment to take a step, or if her step was once again too wide. She thought about the fact that she had the great man constellation and needed to become stronger quickly. Meanwhile, Hack had already gotten dressed and packed his bag to leave, but he turned his attention back to the girl. He asked her if she was crying. Jun raised her hands to her face, heeding her tears, and stuttered in response, Who said I was crying? Her hand holding the sword was shaking, and she looked very tired. Hawk noticed that she had not eaten since morning and had just been swinging the sword mindlessly. This will only make things worse, he remarked, pointing out that this was not what fencing was supposed to be like. Looking at her decisively, he took the bag from his shoulder. Surprised, the girl asked him what he was doing. He replied that she had initially chosen the wrong weapon and walked to the rack with swords, continuing to explain that what was needed was not a light sword, but a two-handed one. He threw his bag on the floor, grabbed one of the balls from the counter, and tossed it over his shoulder, then turned to her. Hack instructed her to watch carefully and, increasing her concentration, he made a very precise attack. Jun staggered from the flow of energy. Chok Jun Jong continued, Liang Hak was so immense in real life that it is almost impossible to replicate his style with a short sword. He handed her the sword and asked if she would try it. The girl grabbed the sword with both hands, looking at him full of determination, and he gazed into her eyes with a kind grin. They took on the roles of student and mentor. In the Phoenix Guild office, the vice president called out to Zhang Su as he loosened his tie. The guy stood in a head plank, not far from the vice president's desk. Dong Seek remarked that this was a crucial moment before evaluating the guild, stressing, You can't do this. He sat down in a chair, relaxing his neck, and continued that, even after delegating all the dirty work to Jia Yun, after all the criticisms from Yun Haiyan's son, he had pushed forward to make the second group as strong as the first. Was it all in vain? He looked at the young man with a mix of contempt and cruelty. Jiang Su, with his forehead pressed to the floor, was sweating profusely and could barely stand on his feet. He begged the red-haired man for forgiveness. The vice president thought about the achievements that had been reset due to one duel. If they lose to a leader who doesn't even reach the highest level of hero, 
everything would be over. Young Sik clenched his fists so hard that veins appeared on his hands, frustrated that Jiayun, who couldn't last ten seconds in previous sparring, had become so strong in just a month. This fact angered the vice president even more than before, and he decided he needed to find out all this but first take care of an urgent matter. The vice president approached the window, put his hands in his pockets, and gazed out at the city at night. Turning to Jiang Su, he inquired, What happened to that item? Rising from his knees and trembling, the man in the suit replied that they had learned it would appear at the auction. They also requested investors to expand the operating fund. Jiang Su believed there was no cause for concern. Yang Gong Sik, showing approval, pressed her fingers against the glass. She quietly muttered that if this were the case, then the plan should proceed smoothly, and he must secure the item soon. A few days later, the organizers and participants of the auction gathered in a vast hall, outfitted with a stage and numerous chairs. Yang Hak, donning a black hoodie and cap to remain inconspicuous, scanned the crowd for the Phoenix Guild. Identifying the vice president, he decided that his primary goal was to ensure that Kimi Sik would win the auction, though he contemplated acquiring something for himself. Hawk opened the auction item list and began to study it intently. Spotting an underground route, he thought it might be a good investment. The auction began with the host warmly welcoming the esteemed guests and expressing gratitude for their patience. The next item, the host announced, is a bow made from twisted orc tendons, Class A, with a starting bid of $48 million. The bow eventually sold for $78 million. The auction featured a variety of items, including battle armor, swords, helmets, a comma, and an underground route. The presenter then introduced the last item, retrieved from a Swedish dungeon, the nightmare of Scandinavian mythology, the sword of the giant CT who turned the world into ashes. Displayed in a glass showcase on a pedestal was an object resembling the rosaf of a young tree. Latine, the presenter shouted loudly as three huge screens at the back of the stage projected an image of the object. The auction participants whispered among themselves, puzzled about why this item was deemed valuable, given its fragile appearance. Someone in the crowd mentioned that the association had tested the items, which implied that this sword must indeed be of high quality. The host shouted that the starting bid for the ball was one billion. Suddenly, a bid of fifty billion was made. The auction participants were very surprised and looked around in an attempt to find out who had made this bid. Was it the Phoenix Guild? They wondered. The vice president and his assistant, Zhang Su, stood in a separate room designated for VIP auction participants. Young Sik thought the cursed sword, which burns everything to the ground, was a worthy weapon for him as the owner of a legendary level constellation contract. Meanwhile, the presenter asked if there was a higher bid and, after a general silence, announced that the sword was sold at the highest bid in the history of the auction. Lee Young Hayak chuckled quietly and muttered, It seems like they really wanted him to spend fifty billion at once. Such a pity that they threw a huge amount down the drain. He looked back with a smile at the VIP chamber where the vice president was meeting with the Phoenix Guild. Young Seek, furious, shouted to the guild president, What is he talking about? The vice president slammed his fist on the table and continued, When we found out that the sword would be sold at auction, we agreed that I would get the weapon myself, and now the president says that it will be given to Koyunu. The president demanded to speak directly. He asked, Who should receive the sword that Wai Seek bought for fifty billion? The man in glasses tapped the table with his finger reproachfully. This was the president of the Phoenix Guild, Haiyan Yun. He continued, for the guild to become the strongest, the artifact must fall into the hands of someone who will use it more effectively. The rest of the meeting participants nodded approvingly. The president stated, We discussed this issue with shareholders all night. Given Leviton's potential growth, it was decided to hand him over to Yunho. Another meeting participant added, Yunho's constellation is at the level of the Creator God, so he will quickly become a ranker, and the Phoenix Guild will strengthen its position. Sun Yun smiled at the vice president and condescendingly said, Another good item will soon appear at the auction, so do not worry. Young Siik, gritting his teeth, agreed with the president. He looked at him with cruel rage after the meeting. He returned to his office and, out of anger, began to destroy everything. He threw pots of plants from the cabinets, scattered papers, and knocked over furniture. Then, he tiredly sat down in his chair, leaned his elbows on his knees, 
and covered his face with his palms. He thought, no, it's not over yet. At what point did everything go wrong? His face contorted with anger. He declared that he could not give in so easily. Ko Yun, who has potential for growth, would benefit the guild. So Yan Sik was hanging around with him. They understand this and have probably come up with something else. The man grabbed his phone and got up from his chair. He went to the window and dialed someone's number. A voice came from the phone. Yes, Vice President? The man called Yung Su asked him to investigate Ko Yun, Hu, and his entourage. He wanted to know something about his goals. In the office of the president of the Phoenix Guild, Zhaun asked the president with genuine surprise, does he really want her to be in charge of So Yun Ho? The vice president is in charge of this. The girl was clearly nervous, and the president, turning a little in his chair, replied that the very idea of a newbie being taught by a high-level ranker from the very beginning was absurd. The president hoped that Jia Yun could help the promising newcomer, which is what he told her. She submissively lowered her gaze but frowned in annoyance. She understood that this issue was very important to the vice president, and it was obvious to whom he would direct his anger. The president informed her that they would transfer the third group to another program, and she could begin a new task. Jun asked to be given one day to talk to the team before leaving. The president accepted her request. The girl, leaving the office, thought that this was not an order but more like a threat. Now, she would not be able to study with Y-Hack. Scoundrels, she thought. She asked so desperately, she even trampled on her pride. She wondered how much harm there would be if she taught herself. The girl walked down the corridor, upset. Several of her charges met her there, and one of the newcomers saw her and asked, What did the president say? Exhaling heavily, Jia Yun said that now their group would be divided between two others, and she would take on another task starting tomorrow. She hoped that the guys would cope with everything, but the president had entrusted her with another matter. Some were excited, others were thoughtful. Young Hack did not interrupt the training when she appeared, but froze when he heard her words. The students happily speculated that the curator had been given an assignment by the president himself. Was this really a long-awaited promotion? Jun walked away from the guys to Yang Hak, calling out to him. Joining her hands in front of her, she said that today was her last day. The guy wiped the sweat from his face with a t-shirt and asked what she was talking about. The girl drooped and remained silent. Turning around, she began to go home. Ihak looked after her in confusion. They say that when a person stops doing what he has always done, it means it's time to die, the girl said at last. D. Yong Hak, at first, didn't understand what she was talking about, but then the realization came to him. She was talking about the vice president. He realized that problems would soon begin in a couple of days at most, and he needed to look for the nearest hotel. In the office of the vice president, Yang Sik asked, What did you say? Jiang Su reiterated that Seo Yun Ho was assigned to Jun's custody. The vice president lashed out at President Haiyan Yun. He rudely ordered the assistant to get lost, and he obeyed. Yong Sik summed up the results. First, the artifact was taken away. Now, it's Seo Yun Ho. The man tensely pulled the phone out of his pocket and, dialing someone's number, brought it to his ear. He asked his interlocutor if his offer was still valid. Yong Sik explained that the situation was getting worse and asked for a favor. He needed to pick up one thing. It flashed through his thoughts that he should take what was his before leaving. Levitin had belonged to him from the very beginning. The vice president answered his interlocutor's next question in the negative, but the fun is about to begin. The next day, in the corridor of the Phoenix Guild building, Seo Yun Ho approached Jae Yun and greeted him kindly, saying that they had not seen each other for a long time. He continued enthusiastically, expressing how impressed he was by her duel, and added that learning from her was a great honor. The girl, showing slight hostility, dismissed him, urging him not to exaggerate. She mentioned that they would leave after she reported to the president and asked him to be prepared. She then inquired if he had the artifact. The blonde guy exclaimed that he would now retrieve the artifact. Jun smiled at his positive attitude and wondered if he knew where the warehouse was located. Humming a tune to himself, Yun, who approached the warehouse, puzzled why the door was open. He entered, closing the door behind him, and loudly asked if anyone was there. Finding the emptiness strange, he turned on the light and was shocked to find the vice president, who had stolen the artifact. Recognizing it was L. Yong Sik, Yun Hu, with a trembling voice, 
began to ask what the man was doing there. But before he could finish, the vice president cut him off, stating that he had seen everything. Engulfed in flames, Yang Sik prepared to strike. Approaching Yun Hu, he grabbed him by the throat, lifting him into the air. Fear and determination appeared in Yun Hu's eyes. Distorted with rage, the vice president exclaimed that it would have been better if he had never invited Yun Hu to the guild. Yun Hu began to lose consciousness. He could not breathe, and his body was enveloped in flames, his clothes slowly burning. Suddenly, Jun burst into the warehouse, attacking the vice president. She shouted his name, aiming to sever the hand that held Yun Hu, but the man dodged. Yun Hu fell, still alive. Jun rushed to him, asking if he was okay. Yun Hu cooed convulsively. Yang Sik, consumed by hatred and anger, screamed Jun's name, his thoughts revealing that she had thwarted all his planes, and now he intended to deal with both of them completely. The artifact in his hand transformed into a flaming sword, and the room was soon engulfed in flames. Are you crazy? Li Jun shouted, covering the newcomer with herself. She continued loudly, accusing the vice president of trying to kill a guild member over a pathetic artifact. She took a fighting stance. Pathetic. Yong Sik repeated her words, bewildered and furious. He yelled, How dare she! and pointed his flaming sword at her. The flames enveloping the sword grew larger, and then a fireball rushed towards the girl. She blocked the attack with her sword. Yang Gong Sik was surprised that his power, enhanced by the sword, was broken by such a pathetic weapon. Shouting, he asked her how she was able to stop the blow. His attacks were repeated, but the girl deftly repelled them. She decided that she needed to hold out until help arrived. Stepping two, three steps forward, and breaking the last stance right in front of Yang Sik, she attacked him. He parried the blow with a huge sword. The girl jumped back. How stupid, said the man. He continued to say that Jai Yun could throw and kick, but she would still remain mediocre. If she wanted to try to stop him, she must put her life on the line. He shouted, how dare she block his path with such pitiful determination? Yi Sik began to emit even more flames. Jun was frightened to realize that she had lost from the very beginning. The difference between a ranker and a B rank was too big, but she had nowhere to run. Looking decisively at her opponent, her sword was melted in some places, and she herself looked shabby. Yet, she firmly decided that she had to hold out, even if she got fried here. The vice president, blinded by rage, wished her death and created a fire spell with his free hand. The girl repelled it and rushed into battle. Yunho's strength was leaving him. He was groaning heartrendingly from pain and carbon monoxide in his lungs. Jun noticed this and rushed towards him, protecting him from the flames. But she herself was hit. She let go of the sword, and the weapon flew to the floor. She swore. Yong Siak told her that it was over and prepared to deal the final blow. The girl tried to cover her body with her hands and wondered if she had made a mistake. She reproached herself for not sending the guild members away, but letting the newcomer go alone. She closed her eyes, ready to accept death, but nothing happened. The girl opened one eye. Lehak came to the rescue, getting between the girl and her opponent, saying that this was not how the battle should look. Jun, shocked by his appearance, stared at the guy. Yong Hak gently patted her on the head, saying that she had done well and did a good job. Yang Gong Sik shouted in confusion, what happened to his flame? Why is this newbie here? The guy resolutely replied that he had come to pick up Li Jun and squeezed the enemy's flame into a fist. Sometime later, in the hospital department, Ko Yun, who was in his room, the blonde guy woke up on his bed and screamed. The Phoenix Guild president, who had paused from reading a book, notified Yun that he had woken up. The guy was surprised to see the president present in the chamber and immediately tried to get up. The president ordered him not to tense up and to stay in bed. He explained that help had arrived to find him lying unconscious in the warehouse. The president continued, saying that Yun and Jae Yun had inhaled toxic smoke and that the consequences could have been much worse if help had arrived any later. He then bowed his head and apologized to the young man for what had happened. Yun, very surprised and unsure how to react in such a situation, listened intently. The president admitted that his inexperience in running the guild almost caused significant problems for both the guy and Jae Yun. Yun frantically denied it, insisting that it wasn't the president's fault. Remembering Jun, the young man asked how the curator was doing. 
The president reassured him that the girl had woken up the previous night and was discharged from the hospital with burns to her respiratory tract, but she would recover. The guy breathed at a sea of relief. The president thoughtfully raised his palm to his face and mentioned that no one had expected her to copy with Kim I sick, and that she needed to apply for a reassessment of her characteristics in the association. Yun, very surprised, clarified, does the president really want to say that Jun defeated Kim I sick? The president replied that traces of a blade and torn clothing were the only things found in the warehouse. It can't be, said Yun, trying to recall what he saw as the curator defended him. Walking straight through the flames, a man appeared who gathered the fire around him into a fist. But Yun had only seen his back. The president asked the young man if he had seen anything else. He answered in the negative, deciding to remain silent for now and that it would be better to ask Jae Yoon first. In Lee Jun's room, the girl, all bandaged, lay on the bed and dreamily recalled the words of her savior that he had come to pick her up. She muttered that sometimes she wanted to give up, but opportunities come to the brave. These difficulties were not in vain, she thought, yet she did not understand how he knew where they were. Grabbing her phone, the girl sent a message with this question to Leek. He replied that he was keeping an eye on her, had noticed her walking past, and then, while chilling in the corridor, saw a fire break out at the other end. Jun didn't understand why he immediately burst in there. She didn't understand why Lei Hak was concealing his abilities. It was risky, and he could have been discovered. When she asked if he considered her his student, his response was brief. Uh-huh, dungeon cave. Lei Hak exhaled, noting that it was a close call. He almost lost his reputation as a mentor. He had observed how YC could stage this incident unnoticed. The guy stood atop a huge pile of dead monsters. Lei Hak acknowledged that he had known in advance that the situation would create problems, but it was better if no one else knew about it. The guy was holding Levatian, the Sword of Sea, in his hands. In the hands of its true owner, it reveals its true form. When Yang Seek wielded the sword, it was enormous, and its structure resembled more of a chain. In Lei Haik's hands, it transformed into a beautiful bright orange sword with a white hilt. Lei Haik admired the weapon with a smile. The system window notified the player that constantly hunting monsters increases his characteristics. His stamina had been raised to level E. Lei Haik reasoned that this should suffice. He noticed that hunting goblins took a whole day, but with orcs, half a day was enough. Bags and sacks filled with crystals and magic stones were slung on his back as he dragged them toward the cave's exit. He estimated that all the ore should be worth about 30 million won. Now that he had found a student, Lei Hawk reasoned it was time to prepare a training area. It was unlikely that anyone was selling a training ground for players, but he had an ideal option in mind. He smiled conspiratorially, hoping no one would come to this place. A few days later, huge fireballs struck the goblins one by one, consuming them in flames. John and Yun, who were standing on the dungeon cliff, watched. The guy, gaining experience, exhaled, wiping sweat from his face and turned to the girl with a wide smile, asking how she would rate his performance. She stood, arms crossed over her chest, and after a moment's thought, gave her assessment. She noted that the guy had excessive mana consumption, a long delay between casting the spell and the attack, causing three monsters to flee. Hun, who drooped, apologized for this. The girl continued, advising him to evaluate his opponent and not waste unnecessary energy. The power is impressive, of course, and in terms of strength, it is likely that you will soon surpass me, she remarked. Yun, immediately embarrassed, began to deny it, insisting that it was completely wrong to think he could surpass her. Then he recalled the incident and the man who saved them in the warehouse. Jai Yun immediately became anxious. She asked if Yun had told anyone about this man. Hearing a positive response, the girl grabbed the fair-haired guy by the clothes, shaking him loudly, reminding him that this was a secret and urgently asking if he understood her. Yoon confirmed that he did and asked her not to worry, assuring her that he would tell absolutely nothing to anyone. Yet he still wanted to know more about the man who saved them and asked his mentor to introduce them. The girl looked at him, a silent question in her mind. What should she do? In dialogue and messages between Lei Hak and Jun, she asked what he was doing now and why he hadn't shown up for training today. What happened? The guy replied that he had quit the beginner program and that when the time came, he would write her the meeting place. 
But for now, he ordered her to just wait and rest, noting her hands were shaking from constant training with the sword. Lehak smiled, looking at the phone, and noted to himself that the problem had been resolved, and now he could concentrate on something else. He stood on the street in front of a three-story red brick apartment building. Choi Jinwook, the former head of the Comet Guild, one of the three strongest guilds in Korea, a tall, dark-haired man with a red headband and ponytail. He was an outstanding ranker but retired after losing both his arms in a fight with a monster. Yet, he had managed to earn enough money to open his own training center for players. Previously, everyone was attracted by its reputation, but now no one needed this training center. Lehak entered the hall and noticed that, unlike other halls which were filled with people at this time, this one was empty. He was worried it would be in an abandoned state, but everything seemed orderly. It appeared the owner still hadn't been able to let go of everything. Lehak shouted loudly, If anyone is here! A fat man with slicked back hair, wearing a t-shirt and jeans, peeked out from behind a door and asked, Who's there? The newcomer smiled and replied that he had come to look at the training center. The man looked at him with distrust and apologized, saying he was not entertaining guests. He suggested that if the visitor was new and wanted to join the guild, he should go elsewhere. Undeterred, the visitor continued to look around the room, asking the owner to show him the top floor. The man was very surprised and angrily replied that guests were not allowed on the upper floors, ordering the visitor to stop loitering. Lei Hock interrupted him, expressing a desire to look around and decide whether he would buy this building, including the equipment if possible. The man grew very angry and stamped his foot, causing cracks to appear across the floor. He growled angrily at the visitor to stop joking and get lost. Lei Hock replied firmly, This is not a joke, and suggested that they discuss and talk about Kang Mansik. A year ago, only players from the Comet Guild had a suitable level to explore the depths of the dungeon labyrinth Andromalius. The players must have earned untold riches by being the only ones in the deep areas of this labyrinth, he explained. Choi Jinwook was probably very annoyed because she wanted to clear the dungeon herself. As a result, the leaders of the Comet Guild came to an agreement with Kang Mansik, and now he had become the president of the guild. Choi Jinwook and Lee Young Hak were sitting in the living room and talking. The man expressed his regret, saying, I shouldn't have trusted Kang Mansik. He added that he barely escaped with his life, looked down sadly, and concluded, In the end, I could not do anything. The Andromalius Labyrinth is considered the easiest of the 72 dungeons, the young man thought. If the current president of the Comet Guild had not betrayed JNUK and cleared out the dungeon, the appearance of the fourth dungeon would have been greatly delayed, he reflected. The man said it would be better for you to look for another place, Lehak was told. A little surprised, Lay asked if the owner would show the upper floors. He added that he wanted to buy the entire building. Choi Jinwook began to get annoyed by this. He stated that the vile Kang Mansik was overseeing this place and that the guild would most likely not allow it to be sold. Lei Haik enthusiastically replied, There is both a buyer and a seller. Could there really be any legal problems? The man replied that the problem was with the Comet Guild. They were chasing all the newcomers who came to this center. He shouted, asking if the guy thought that the guild would leave him alone and let him sell this place. Lei Haik chuckled and asked, Can he figure this out? The man replied that it was impossible to negotiate with them. Choi Jinwook asked how the guy planned to cover the expenses if this place had no customers. Lei Hock said enthusiastically, that would be even better. The man decided that the guy had definitely lost it. The young man still insisted on seeing the second floor. The man exhaled heavily and tried to dissuade him, warning him not to complain later. Lei Haik cheerfully asked him not to worry thinking to himself that he had found Choi Jinwook to get a training center, but the main goal for him was Kang Man-sik. Jana does not act alone. We need to lure him to his former ally, Phoenix Guild. Ji Yun entered the building with a thoughtful and even irritated expression. Yun, who asked if something had happened the day before, received a dry response from the girl. Nothing happened. She reflected that she was willing to train as hard as she could. Mentally, she appealed to Lei Hak. If he wanted to give up everything, then he should just say so and not brush off excuses that he would write later. She whispered, It's so difficult with him, constant chaotic actions. Yunho, startled by the girl's voice, asked who she was talking about. Is it really about that person? She panicked and quickly made the excuse that she was just muttering to herself. The guy looked downtrodden. 
and she thought that she should be more careful. She didn't know why Yun, who was looking for him, but she had to take into account that young Haig was hiding his powers. Yun asked the girl why they had come to the association and what had happened. She handed a piece of paper to the guy, explaining that she would make a short report and asked him to wait there, saying she would be back soon. The girl entered the room where the meeting was taking place, greeted everyone, and introduced herself as the person in charge of investigating the gargoyle anomaly. After stating her name, she was invited to proceed. She scanned the room, observing all those present, the staff of the research group, management, and the president of the association. She noticed a young man with purple hair and an earring, who announced that since everyone was assembled, the meeting could begin. June realized that this was Kang Man Sik, the president of the Comet Guild. She was puzzled by his presence. A little later, after June had finished her report, Kang Man Sik approached her, inquiring whether she was suggesting that the anomaly was appearing due to the snake at the center of the dungeon. The young man seemed detached, doodling on a piece of paper in front of him. The girl confirmed his query and added that during the investigation of the latest case, it had been confirmed that anomalies were emanating from the depths of the dungeon and that the consequences could quickly become unpredictable. She further stated that regardless of the specific cause, the dungeon still posed a threat and should be cleared sooner. Before she could finish speaking, she was interrupted by Kang Man Sik, the president of the Comet Guild. He questioned why she was making such statements and whether she was prepared to take responsibility for her words. His gaze, intense and scrutinous, instilled fear in her. Jun hesitated and fell silent. He continued, explaining that clearing the dungeon was not an easy task and that many lives were at stake. He expressed curiosity about what Jun would say to those for whom this was the only way to earn a living. Kang Man Sik conceded that she might be right in her assessment, but he believed the issue required a broader examination. Kong Man Sik stood up from his seat, approached the girl, and said impressively that the players were not involved in charity work. Everyone was fighting for their survival, so it was essential to focus on one's own needs first. He said this threateningly, and, stepping closer to her, placed his hand on her shoulder, filling her with fear. He proposed assembling a new research group to verify everything, and stated that they would act only after thorough examination. Then, he ordered the meeting to end. The girl was trembling with fear and anger. She thought it was stupid. The association was blinded by the thirst for profit and adapted to the guilds. Jun realized that she couldn't handle this alone and sent a message to her mentor asking for help. The guy yawning drew attention to the message, which was a request for help. The girl wrote that it was necessary to clear the Andromalius labyrinth as quickly as possible. Kang Man Sik had attended the association meeting that day. Lei Hak, peering at the text of the message in surprise, hadn't expected the president of the Comet Guild to make the first move. Was it really all about saving June? She probably advocated for a quick clearing of the dungeon so that guy intervened. And, most likely, no matter what Lei Hak tried to say, she would still go to the dungeon, even alone. The guy imagined a militant June screaming that she could handle it herself. It wasn't difficult for him to guess that if she ended up at the death depths with her current skills, she would simply die. Then, all the trouble with the student would have been in vain. He replied to her message, asking her to wait a little and said that he would call soon. He reasoned that it was still early, but there was no choice, and he supplemented his message with the words that he would teach her another special technique. Guild Comet is a high-rise building with a helipad on the roof. The girl was very surprised when she heard the news that someone had come to Choi Jin Wook's training center. Her name is Hanu Yan. She is the leader of the first group of the Comet Guild. The girl immediately brushed off her interlocutor, saying it was just some passerby who had dropped in by chance. She asked her interlocutor to deal with it like last time and said that she could handle it herself. The guy with blue hair, wearing black clothes, who was talking to her, replied that it seemed to him that this guy should not be left without attention. He hangs out there for half a day and does it regularly. The girl imperiously ordered to proceed as usual and find out what Choi Jin Wook had told the training center. Lee Young Hak sits in a chair drinking iced coffee. He is pleased that there is not a soul around. The owner of the center approached him and asked if he was bored, noting that he had been coming here for several days in a row and just sitting. The man without arms repeated once again that he was not going to sell the building. The guy just laughed, 
remembering the proverb that a tree will not fall with one blow. The man answered, What kind of trees? There's only one stump left. There is nothing to cut down. The guy threw away the coffee cup, stood up, stretched, and said with a smile that he had a good rest, but it was time for him to go. Jinwook asked if he was very busy. The guy replied, Not really, and asked if the man wanted him to sit there longer. The owner of the training center immediately turned away, gritting his teeth, and told the guy to get lost if he was going to continue, urging him not to distract him from watching the news. Leaving the building, Lei Hack said goodbye to the owner with a smile, saying that they would see each other tomorrow and playfully called him president. The man reacted violently, asking what kind of president he was and shouting that he still wouldn't sell. The guy reasoned that the owner of the training center need not worry, and although the employees of the Comet Guild were later than expected, they were eventually hooked. A player with purple hair from the Comet Guild approached Lei Hock, asked for his forgiveness, and clarified his name. They moved to a cafe, and the Guild employee asked if Y Hack would like something to drink. He refused, stating that he still had his drink, and took the business card handed to him. He mentally read, Comet Guild Player Support Group Leader Lei Hyun Su. Lei Hock asked his interlocutor to hurry up and get to the point, saying that he still had things to do. Lei Hyun Su replied that he would speak directly. They would like to support Lei Hock, a player with great potential, and were offering a six month membership to the best training center in Korea. Lei Hock picked his ear with his little finger, looked away with indifference, and asked if they were joking themselves. Hyun Su apologized and asked what was the matter. The guy responded with a question Where did they find great potential in a rank F player who hadn't even joined the guild? The guy exhaled distantly and stood up stating that he didn't appreciate such jokes. He added that it was time for him to leave if that was all. Hien Su tried to stop him, but the official intervened, saying that his drink was ready. Annoyed and bewildered, Hien Su asked why now and what was wrong with this guy. Lei Hak left the cafe, smiled broadly, and walked down the street, reasoning that they had played on his nerves and next time they would come with threats. He wondered who it would be. He looked at his phone and quickly typed a message for Jai Yoon, asking him to come to the dungeon tomorrow evening. He decided that while he was waiting for the Comet Guild's next move, he could meet with the student. Jai Yoon walked in high spirits in the raid, humming some kind of melody. Yoon, who trudged behind her, very tired, turned to him and asked what he was doing there, adding that it was better to walk faster in order to be free early. The guy mumbled tiredly that he was already on his way on shaky legs. He added, can we walk a little slower? Jun realized that her ward was tired and suggested taking a break for a halt. They chose a shady place where the blonde guy sat down at its roots and, exhaling heavily, apologized to his mentor. She said it was nothing and that it was her fault for not paying attention. Jun took out a cooling patch from her bag and stuck it on Yun's forehead. Relieved, Yun thanked her, to which she cheerfully replied that there was no need to be so formal and that he could address her on a more personal level. Yun objected, noting that he was the youngest and also a student. Then he asked her if something good had happened. The girl was a bit surprised by the question. Yun added that she seemed depressed when they left the association, but now she looked quite happy. He mentioned how much she smiled when they collected magic stones, which made him worry. The girl began to deny this, but then she remembered the message from Lei Hak. After ensuring that the wards had already rested, she suggested they move on. Yoon quickly jumped to his feet and asked her to wait for him. Meanwhile, Lei Hawk was on the bus again. It was already dark outside. Dejected, he sighed, thinking about how he had provoked the guild. Yet, they did not appear. He had expected them to break into his house by now. Maybe someone intervened. Perhaps Choi Jinwook was not betrayed by all the guild leaders. It would have been easier if Su Young had gone straight to Lei Hawk. Lei Hawk got off at the stop opposite the territory of the portals to the dungeon. He entered the portal and immediately, a joyful Jai Yoon ran out to meet him, exclaiming that they had not seen each other for a long time. Lei Hak was surprised that she considered this a long time, as it had not even been a week. Angrily, the girl mentioned that last time, she didn't even see his face and he hadn't visited her in the hospital. Irritably, Lei Hak asked why he would do such a thing when he had helped and there were too many people there. She immediately broke into a smile, asking if he still wanted to visit her. He replied affirmatively, somewhat evasively, and also asked if she had been training hard. After exhaling heavily and thinking a little, the girl replied that she had followed all his instructions, but there was no progress at all. 
Lei Hak noticed her bandaged fingers and told her to follow him. They approached a rocky cliff. The red-haired girl asked if they were going deeper into the dungeon. He replied that she would soon see everything and began to actively probe the rocks, asking, Where is it? Suddenly he felt something, exclaimed joyfully and cast a spell on that spot. Both were teleported inside the cave. The girl exclaimed in surprise and asked if Lei Hak had come here that time. He told her not to compare this place with the bonus level where there are only goblins. Just then, a huge monster appeared from the high rocks. Lei Hak explained that he was approaching. Confused, the girl asked again what he was doing as the huge monster screamed heartrendingly. Overcome with fear, the one-eyed monster noticed them, and questions immediately rained down on Lei Hak about what it was. She loudly called out his name to attract attention and get an answer. The guy quietly asked her to refer to him as teacher during training. Without hesitation, the girl repeated her question, addressing him as teacher. He informed her that they were facing a cyclops, which is stronger than three ogres. Then he casually added, aren't you ready? She seemed not to understand his question and asked again, are you ready? It can't be. The guy smiled conspiratorially. He explained that before teaching her a special move, he needed to test her skills. Grinning, he looked at her and pointed his thumb at the Cyclops. Worried, the girl mumbled to him that if he couldn't handle just one giant, how could she possibly kill such a monster? He replied that her desire to become stronger was the reason she followed him everywhere. The girl lowered her head and asked Lei Hak not to exaggerate. He questioned why she couldn't handle the ogre. With a look of bewilderment, she stared at him. He challenged her, asking if she considered herself merely a simple B-rank player. His confident gaze, decisive and encouraging, told her not to give up until she had tried. He clarified that he wasn't asking her to win but would assist in a pinch. She shouldn't be afraid. The mentor's words gave Yaun confidence. She assertively stated that she understood him and would try. Lehak gave her a pep talk and told her to fight with all her might. The girl drew her sword from its sheath and, clutching it with both hands, rushed into battle. The Cyclops, furious, screamed again. The girl leaped towards it and attempted to cut off its leg. The monster was not just ten times, but a hundred times bigger than her. Yao noticed something happening to the sword at the moment of the attack and glanced at it. Meanwhile, the Cyclops bulged a huge red eye at her and, clenching his hand into a fist, began to attack. Cracks appeared along the rocky ground of the cave. The girl managed to jump away and, in the next moment, decisively struck a second blow. She didn't understand why the attacks didn't work. The Cyclops struck again. She closed her eyes, realizing she did not have time to dodge. It's too late, flashed through her thoughts. Lehak asked her what she was doing. Instantly, the monster's fist was enveloped in flames, and Lehak, appearing out of nowhere, stood right in front of the student. He not only repelled the attack, but also struck back, causing the Cyclops to stagger. Lehak frowned and asked what Jai Yun had been doing during training. Chaotic swings of the sword? That's not what I showed you, he said. She asked, confused. The last few days I've been exhausting myself completely. Is this the best strike I could make? Her stream of thoughts was interrupted by her mentor's attacking sword. She looked at the way his legs moved, her eyes wide with fascination. The guy realized that she had grasped everything and smiled slightly, saying, I forgot the technique of moving my legs. The enraged Cyclops screamed and Lei Hawk urged her, don't worry, just remember and hit. Gripping the sword tightly, she resumed her fighting stance filled with determination. The movements of her arms and legs flashed through her head. She had repeated them hundreds, no, thousands of times. With lightning speed, the girl moved towards the Cyclops. He swatted her away with his massive hand and Yaun was slammed into the wall. Yet, she stubbornly rose to her feet once again. Bracing herself for another attack, she was determined that she could handle it. Launching a flurry of strikes at the monster, scratches finally began to appear on its surface. The Cyclops fell to his knees and rested his hands on the ground. The girl climbed up his arm and found herself poised above him. It's hard and painful, though, she thought. Yaun shouted, you can win! With that, she severed the monster's head, and it fell dead before her. Breathing heavily, she stood over it. Lehak observed her, thinking how unusual she had seemed from the start but her talent exceeded all expectations. Maybe this time they can, he mused, fascinated by her determination and inner strength. Suddenly, he stopped short, remembering his original goals. 
Shaking his head negatively, he told himself, this time, it was just a break. A system window appeared in front of Hyun, announcing, the player has accomplished the impossible and defeated an opponent who was much stronger. This success impressed even Constellation players. Jiang's mana increased to D level, her strength to C level, and her agility to B minus level. The player has awakened the technique, one step, one kill, mastery of this technique, four out of five. The girl fell to the ground as if convincing herself, and exclaimed loudly, I have won! I defeated Lei Hak! I can do it! He praised her with a smile on his face and reminded her, Don't forget, during training, I should be called teacher. Laughing through tears, she accepted his remark, calling him teacher. 